Um, yeah, we'll get to the questions here in just about a couple of minutes. Um, you can't see this from back there. What, what we have here is a piece of jewelry from one of the burial chambers of the kings of Egypt or the pharaohs. In the middle, mid pole, you find, I don't know what you call them out here, we call them dung beetles back in the States. Well, scarab beetles what we call them when we find them in Egypt. But you call them scarab beetles here? Uh, beetles here. All right, it's jolly good. Any, excuse me? Oh, okay. Anyway, you know how they uh, roll up these balls of uh, manure, lay their egg in it. Well, the ancient, uh, shall we say, the founders of these kingdoms in Egypt despised God to the point uh, that they taught their children that a great celestial dung beetle rolled up all of the planets, the sun, the moon, and all of this. And of course, they wouldn't let anybody teach them any different. So they grew up believing this. And these things persisted for thousands of years along the, in the civilizations along the Nile. Today, we have people who want to teach in our universities that God doesn't exist and uh, all the things you see up here are mythical. Uh, and they would like very much to stop anyone from saying anything to the contrary. So you can see where it led at one point in history and where it could very easily lead again if these people had their way. It's always the people who do not have any proof whatsoever about their theories and things that try to stop those who have evidences for what they believe uh, from showing them. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says that, let's see here, we'll just read it. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or not, you know, beneficial to them. Now, as I have said many times, I'm not sure if I said it here or not, the fact that we believe what we do is an accident of birth. And uh, we could have just as easily been Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, if we had been born in those countries and taught what these people are taught. And that's just, just the way it goes. We believe what we're taught. Now, I've always admired the uh, Japanese, very clever people. You know, they attempted to build a pyramid there in Egypt uh, back in 78, <laughs> and uh, they weren't able to do it uh, using the sand realm theory and some of the other theories that are involved. Uh, that people have come up with. Now, they didn't try the levitation. I don't think they could have found anybody that, you know, practiced that art, that mythical art. But anyway, those people up until the end of World War II believed that their emperor, Hirohito, uh, was a god. They believed that. Uh, many of them at the end of the war committed Harry Carey, Harry Carey uh, these guys bombing uh, planes that they flew into U.S. ships and things called the Divine Wind. And uh, so anyway, of people that are that clever, up until 1946, <clears throat> believed that the emperor was God, and still some of the older people there believe this, that to this day because they refuse to except anything else. Well, bless their hearts, we, we think them, of them as being rather naive, misguided, and stubborn to their own, uh, shall we say, 
disadvantage, but we can find ourselves in the same situation if we're not willing to give up deceptions that we have been taught all of our life. I've had to give up quite a few of them, you know. And if we're not willing to do that, basically God can't help us with the truth. We have to first let go of the lies, especially when we see the truth, in order to benefit from it. Because if we refuse to accept it and give up, you know, uh, things that we've been taught, and uh, there are people, scientists, who write papers, uh, there's one fellow who is an acquaintance of mine. <clears throat> he wrote an article back in 79 about the two cities up on the mountains in uh, Jordan, speculating that they were quite likely Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, it's rather amazing. This fellow has a Ph.D., M.D., and I forget what all else after his name. Uh, so he had to be fairly intelligent. You know, you can't order those from Sears Roebuck or wherever, and, uh, but here he's calling cities of the mountains, cities of the plains, basically I guess it indicates a disbelief in the accuracy of the Bible, but when we showed him all of the evidences for Sodom and Gomorrah, he was too proud or something to, uh, you know, admit that these were much better candidates than the other. And uh, tragically, right after that experience, after he, you know, started telling everybody that, that these places were not the best candidates, you know, uh, with the sulfur balls and the ash Canaanite cities and all of that, he kind of lost it. He got a book that had a picture of the Ohura Gorge in it, said that he blew that up and saw a lot of ancient inscriptions in the granite uh, stone around the base of the Ohura Gorge. He translated them to say uh, that this was Noah's grave, the ark had landed there, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, so I got the paper, a copy of the paper that someone gave me, and I couldn't believe the man had written it. So I called him, he said yes. I wrote that article. Uh, what's wrong with it? I said, well, number one, that part of the Ahura Gorge was the middle of Mount Ararat up until 1848 when the earthquake blew that stone out. So any inscriptions that were there, and I don't believe there are any, <coughs> date back no farther than 1848. And uh, so anyway, he kind of hung the phone up. <laughs> but uh, we have to be extremely careful, folks. Uh, we, don't, we aren't equipped with a computer that can keep us from being deceived. We just simply do not have the, what it's, what's necessary to keep the devil slithering us like he does there, you know, many, many other people. So we have to pray and ask the Lord to help us know what the truth is, to recognize it, appreciate it, and act on it. I mean, his son died for us. He deserves some loyalty. <coughs> and that loyalty, of course, includes recognizing and accepting the truth when it comes along. Okay, let's go for the questions, please. Okay, if I can see the hands again, please. I think it's the first one shot up there. Okay, we'll start with you, sir. I'm interested to know where you found the artifacts out in the, in the ocean. How far from the shore you were, what depth there was, and whether you had the opportunity to go back and look for the sea just how much you could find. Okay, the uh, artifacts, the, the chariot wheels, the human skeletal remains, and all of this, uh, we found them from uh, depths of 60 feet out to well, 200 feet, uh, scuba diving. As you, I don't know if any of you here are scuba divers, but you can only stay 200 feet for five minutes. Otherwise, you gotta go through a lot of decompressing and all of that. Uh, 
they start something like a quarter of a mile out from the shore, uh, closer in than that. The coral is so thick, the coral growth, that you can't identify anything. <clears throat> However, if you're familiar with coral, it has to attach to something that's on the bottom. It can't just, you know, attach to the silt or the sand or whatever. So most likely, all of the coral that's in there is attached to some of these remains. Uh, there's evidence, as you saw in the video, that these people, uh, that Moses sent some people along ahead to take the larger stones and carry them off to the side, clearing a pathway because they had wagons and things with them. And uh, this area, or this whatever you would clear area, heading across is uh, about three kilometers wide, approximately. Uh, I haven't had any means to actually measure it. This is a guesstimate. Uh, but in that area, there's tremendous amounts of coral, and that's where we find all of these uh, remains. And we've dove out there several times.
but in the inscriptions in Egypt, there's uh, many representations of these eight spoke wheels, but they have only been found in the crossing site. We found three of them to date. Uh, and uh, that's the only place the, the real thing has ever been found, so I suspect that that was the 600 chosen chariots and all of them were lost is why none of them are found in, in you know, around Egypt. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sort of thing, 
and I don't think anybody could doubt that they were highly motivated. <laughs>
much not to be taking in vain. So if you're going to use a slang word about a god, it's better to use wow. <laughs>
negotiation that went on if he had had a, been afraid of this I am, in my opinion. Okay. years. 
years back, somebody was going through this same tour and they found one of these in a dustbin. Uh, apparently, the monk that was doing the inscribed writing on it made a goof and threw it out. Well, this fellow took it. It was a copy of the New Testament and it got to be known as the Codex uh, Sinaiticus, right? And, uh, of course, it was a recent forgery. However, some other monks in Alexandria and at the Vatican uh, quickly came up with some others, or two more recently manufactured ancient manuscripts called the Codex Alexandrianus, Codex Vaticanus, and these are incorporated in your newer versions of the Bible. And so, anyway, it's tragic when you think you're reading God's Word and you're reading some guy's opinion of, of what he wished God had said. The only one that has not been contaminated in that manner is the authorized King James Version of the Bible. Also, in order to get a copyright on the Bible, you have to change the meaning, not just the pronunciation, meaning 40%. And the hit was made in the area of the blood of Christ, the Trinity, and other uh, crucial elements in, uh, in the Bible. And so my very strong recommendation is that if you're going to read the Bible, read the authorized King James Version, because otherwise you're filling your head up with garbage. You're most welcome. Thanks for asking the question.
So the cloud led him to the right beach, got over the water where he had already made the path. Okay? So they didn't need to have any uh, personal knowledge of all this. Well, uh, our first uh, information was out of Admiralty maps. And of course, since this uh, thing is, is so shallow there and you have all the, this massive volumes of water on either side with the tidal flow, the, the velocity of the water crossing over this land bridge is tremendous. So when they let down their weight, you know, to measure how many fathoms or whatever else it was deep, it would get swept off and distort the depth. So the best uh, depth measurement we could get prior to the satellite uh, measurement, which is accurate, uh, was 900 feet to 1,000 feet. Okay, thank you kindly. Anybody else? Was there one more up this side? When um, Egypt suffered the plagues and the events leading up to the um, exodus, um, Egypt would have been basically destroyed and to have um, a major part of their economy just disappear out of their existence, it would have um, destroyed Egypt completely almost. Is there any um, indication from Egyptian history of that that's the case? Right. Okay, uh, I'll repeat that in case everybody didn't hear it. He was saying uh, the destructive acts of God upon Egypt and its economy, uh, plus the loss of their slaves and all of this, would have really made a big hit uh, on their civilization and their uh, power as a nation or a kingdom in that time. Is there any, uh, what we would call, uh, extra biblical reference to a period of that nature? Is that roughly what you're talking about? I'm sort of looking for Egyptian um, evidence. From yeah, the fact is, yes, there is. There are stories about the Exodus. They said a, a person by the name of Moses, who was a leper, took a large bunch of lepers and other uh, manner of afflicted people out. See, they didn't like what really happened. Also, Tut, there's uh, evidence that he was the firstborn that died at the time of the Exodus. Uh, his mother and uh, made his younger brother, Pharaoh, uh, and they moved the capital up uh, about halfway between Thebes and, uh, and Cush. Uh, Nubia, and uh, indicating that they no longer had the ability to defend as much, you know, the borders of Egypt to the north. Uh, so yes, that's documented quite well in uh, secular history. That was the word I was scrambling around for there. And, and feel free to jump in and help me out. You know, if you, if you know what I'm trying to think of. You can. Okay, well, this is, this is going to be the last one. How many Egyptians were killed in the crossing? How many Egyptians were killed in crossing? Well, the whole Egyptian army. In Psalms 109, it says that not so much as one of their enemies escaped. So the Pharaoh, contrary to the, picture, uh, the movie picture by Cecil B. DeMille, Pharaoh died in the Red Sea and his entire army. Uh, chances are that there was a chariot and a cavalry force of some 200,000, 20,000 charioteers uh, with two, one, two, and three man chariots, uh, plus their horse uh, soldiers. So. Uh, in the area next to the Egyptian side, uh, right down the middle of where the water would have come together, there's this big roll of debris, which includes human bones, horse bones, skeletal parts. It appears as though the water just smothered them, crushed them into the silt and sand there in the bottom. Now also, we know that the major portion 
of them were washed up on the other side because the Israelites were able to walk among the dead bodies and collect swords and other implements of war. See, they left Egypt without any kind of weapon. A month after they crossed the Red Sea, the Bible says that Joshua and the men of war put the Amalekites to the edge of the sword. So God not only destroyed the Egyptian army, but he armed the Israelites uh, with their weapons. It's rather a spectacular miracle when you consider what all took place out there. All right, thank you very kindly, folks. I appreciate, again, your coming. I appreciate the good questions. And that's how I know what God wants to discuss is by your question. I don't know you folks personally, but he does. And he knows what people need to hear and all of that. So anyway, may God continue to bless you. And I hope to see you here tomorrow evening. Thank you very much.